I'm Mrs. Buchanan and I am a third grade teacher at Fountain City Elementary School and I'm really happy that you are choosing to learn with me today. You're making a really great choice by deciding to spend some of your time in the summer keeping your reading brain strong. Now today you can follow along with me in this video but you can also get any paper handouts for this activity in the student resource tab right on the Knox County Schools website. Now, if you join me for activity one, you can also find a completed example of the writing task from that activity in the student resource tab. So if you'd like, you could even use it to go back to your writing from activity one and make sure it has all the important parts of a good opinion paragraph. So it's a great way to check your work and make your work stronger. Our plan for today is to read, talk, and prepare to write in response to what we read today. If you want to become a more fluent, stronger reader, then reading, talking, and writing is definitely the way to do it. Now, before we get to our activity, I have a few helpful tips for you just in case you're having any trouble understanding this video. If you are watching along on your TV today, you can turn on closed captions if they're available. Just ask an adult to help you if you're not sure how. Another strategy to help you is to adjust the playback speed of the video if possible. This means slowing the video down as you watch. You can also use the pause feature at any time if that's available. This is helpful if you need a little more time or just a moment to let your brain catch up. And it can also sometimes be helpful to pause and rewind if you feel like you missed something important. My last tip is to watch this video with someone else at home if you can. Then you can pause often and you can talk to your partner about what you heard, what you understood, and maybe anything that you're not quite sure about. Okay, let's get to work. Before we get back into the text today, we're going to do a little word work. I've got a little mystery for you. I'm going to show you several words in a moment, and I want you to see if you notice any patterns or things that the words have in common. Now, you'll have to look closely. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Remember, you're looking for any patterns or similarities in these words. Did you notice any? Maybe you noticed that some of these words share common endings. You might remember that we can call these suffixes. Now, several of these words have the T-I-O-N ending or suffix. Others have the S-I-O-N ending. And others have the T-U-R-E ending. All of these are special suffixes called derivational suffixes. Now, these suffixes are special because they get added to the end of a root word or a base word. They also change the part of speech of the base word. For example, celebrate is the base word in celebration. Celebrate is a verb, right? To celebrate is an action. But if you add the T-I-O-N, the shun ending to celebrate, you have the word celebration. Now it's not a verb or action anymore. It's a noun. A celebration is a thing. In fact, if you join me for activity one, we briefly mentioned that celebrations can be a unique characteristic of different cultures. Now derivational suffixes also have meaning. 
when they are combined with a root or a base word. They can change the meaning of a word. That is so cool. Let's take a look. In this table, you see the three suffixes we're learning about today, their meanings, and an example of a word with each suffix in it. The T-I-O-N suffix means an act or process of. See it right there in the table, T-I-O-N, meaning act or process of. So when we look at the word instruction, you might notice that the base word was instruct, which means to teach. Instruct is a verb. But when we add the T-I-O-N suffix, instruction now becomes the process or the act of teaching. So now it's a noun. Suffixes are pretty powerful, aren't they? So then we see the S-I-O-N suffix in our table, and that also means the act or process of. Our example word is precision. The base word of precision is precise. Now precise means exact, so it's a describing word. What part of speech is a describing word? Right, we call those adjectives. But when we add the S-I-O-N suffix, the word becomes precision, which is the act or process of being precise. So now it has changed completely to a noun. That is so neat. And then last, we see the T-U-R-E suffix, and it shows actions or results of something. Our example word is structure. Now the root word of structure is struct. Struct is not a full word by itself, so this is why we call it a root word, not a base word. And the root word struct relates to building. Structure is a noun, which means the results of a building. So after we build something, it is called a structure. We can call our results a structure. I really love learning about word parts and about their meaning because once you know the meaning of a word part, like these suffixes, you can add them to lots of root or base words and that can help you better understand what those words mean. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? Now my challenge for you is to look for these derivational suffixes that we learned about in our text today. Also look for them in any other text that you're reading at home this summer. All right, now let's look at the big ideas that we will be thinking about as we read today. Remember, all of the third grade summer reading activities you complete will relate to culture. What is culture? Right, culture is a way of life. Culture might involve the kinds of food we eat, the clothing we wear, traditions we have and things we celebrate, or things we believe in. People are all different, so people have all different cultures. In all of the third grade summer reading activities, you'll be focusing on this essential or important question. What happens when two ways of life come together? Now this question is asking about cultures. What happens when two different cultures or ways of life come together? And as we read today, we will dig a little deeper into that idea by thinking about how the text shows that all cultures have unique characteristics like clothing. We will focus on the special or unique clothing of two different cultures in the text today. Today, our job will be to finish reading the text we began back in activity one, and the text we are reading is an expository text. Remember, that means it's nonfiction. It's going to give us real facts and details that support a main idea. And the text might also provide us with helpful pictures, keywords, 
and other helpful features to help us learn all about the topic. So here we see the first portion of the text that we read back in activity one. The title of the text is Clothes, Bringing Cultures Together. We already know that we're going to be reading about people's unique clothing and cultures. So this title really seems to fit in with our goal for reading today. Now back in activity one, we use the text features to help us better understand the text. We saw a map that showed us which cultures, ponchos, and other pieces of clothing first came from. We also used headings and photographs to help us better understand the text. We learned that ponchos were pieces of clothing that were first made in South America thousands of years ago. Now they were made from the wool of llamas, which are a type of animal. And the reason they were made was so that South Americans could stay warm in cold weather. We also learned that in the 1900s, people in America began to wear ponchos for several reasons. They liked their style, they liked that ponchos could keep them warm, and they even used the idea of ponchos to create rain ponchos out of a different material to keep them dry in the rain. So are you ready to get back into the text today and learn about some other cultures and their unique clothing? Me too. Let's get to it. Do you see any helpful text features as you look at today's portion of text? Did you say that you see headings again? Yes, remember those are helpful because they give us a better idea of what a portion of text will be mostly about. What other features do you see? Did you notice the same style or pattern of photos with labels that we saw when we read about ponchos? It looks like we might learn about each piece of clothing in the past and then now in more modern times because we see the arrow pointing to past and present. Now we see a heading on this page, so let's make sure we read it together. Native American moccasins. Hmm, so which culture do you think we will read about? Right, Native American culture. You may have learned about early Native American tribes in social studies this year, which is awesome. Another social studies connection. What piece of clothing do you think we'll read about? Right, moccasins. Let's read the first two paragraphs where the bracket is together now to see if we learn more about moccasins and of course how they relate to Native American culture. Long ago, Native people of North America made shoes out of animal hides. These shoes were called moccasins. Moccasins were tough and comfortable. They kept the wearer's feet warm. They also protected feet from cold, rough ground. Moccasin styles were different from tribe to tribe. You could tell what tribe people belong to by looking at their shoes. For example, the Blackfeet tribe was called that because they dyed their moccasins black. Wow, we did read that moccasins were created long ago by the native people of North America, and those are also called the Native Americans. Now I know that moccasins are a type of clothing, but did we learn more specifically what type of clothing they are? Yes, the text says moccasins are a type of shoe. What were moccasins made from? Right, they were made from animal hides. Now I know the word hide can be a verb, when it means to make something difficult to find, right? You can hide something. Is that what it means here? 
Do you have any clues? Maybe you thought carefully about moccasins being made from animal hides. This means that hides must be a thing these types of shoes were made of, right? So in this context, hides is not a verb. It's a noun, it's a thing. Another clue was that these have to do with animals. Hmm, so what could come from animals that would be used to make good shoes. Did you say the animal skin and coat? Yeah, good work. That's exactly what animal hides are. Now, why were moccasins so helpful to the Native Americans? Right, they kept their feet warm and protected them from the cold, rough, ground. Now those things sound very important to me because I would definitely not want to have to walk barefoot on cold rough ground. We also read an interesting fact about how moccasins were different from one tribe or group to another. And moccasins could help tell those tribes apart. I guess it makes sense that the tribe wearing black moccasins was called the Blackfeet tribe. That's pretty interesting. Let's read the next two paragraphs together to find out who else started wearing moccasins. Native Americans taught European settlers how to make moccasins. Trappers and explorers wore these shoes in the wilderness. Even Lewis and Clark made and wore moccasins on their trip west. Today, Americans of many backgrounds wear moccasins. They like the soft comfort of the shoe. Ah, so who else began wearing moccasins? Yes, Native Americans taught European settlers, people who came to North America from Europe long ago, how to make their own moccasins. Even Lewis and Clark, Two famous explorers made and wore moccasins as they explored. Now, why do you think European settlers chose to wear moccasins? Did you say because they were really helpful for protecting their feet and keeping them warm? Absolutely, I agree with you. Now, in activity one, we learned that ponchos are part of modern fashion or fashion today. Is this also true for moccasins? Yes, the text says that today, Americans of many backgrounds or cultures like the soft, comfortable shoes. Hmm, so we decided it seemed that the photographs would be showing us what moccasins looked like long ago and what they look like now, right? So let's read the caption to find out more. Members of the Blackfeet tribe, Top, wore moccasins that were dyed black. These colorful moccasins above were made years ago by Native Americans. The moccasins below are similar to those worn today. Wow, so how do these photos help us, the reader? Absolutely, if you said they help us visualize what the moccasins of the Blackfeet tribe looked like long ago, and what more modern moccasins look like today, you are absolutely right. Now in this next portion of text, I see another heading. And we know that headings are helpful text features. So let's read it now. Basque berets. Hmm, I remember seeing berets on page one in our text. And those are those pieces of clothing. So Basque must be the culture that they were first part of. Let's read the first paragraph to find out more about this clothing and this culture. 
A beret is a soft, round hat. Hundreds of years ago, the Basque people made these hats out of wool. Basque shepherds tended their flocks in the cold mountains between France and Spain. These hats kept their heads warm. Okay, so we learned more about berets. What are they? Right, a beret is a soft, round hat. And why did the Basque people make these? Yes, underlined in the text. Did you notice that the text said Basque shepherds tended their flocks in the cold mountains between France and Spain? Now a shepherd is a person whose job is to watch and take care of sheep. So they tended or took care of their flock or group of sheep. We learned that they did this job in the cold mountains. So according to the text, how did berets help them? Right, berets helped keep their head warm. That makes sense if they were working in the cold mountains. Here's a photo of a shepherd to help you better visualize this person and his or her job. All right, let's go ahead and read the last two paragraphs to learn about how berets became popular with other people too. In the 1920s, British tank soldiers started wearing black berets. The hats were comfortable. They didn't show grease stains. During World War II, some British soldiers gave American soldiers berets to wear. The hats were seen as special. Today, some units of the United States military wear berets. Berets became popular with American women in the 1930s. Berets are still worn by men, women, and children as part of everyday outfits. Hmm. So why did we learn that British soldiers who worked on army vehicles called tanks begin to, win, to wear berets? Hmm. Why did they do that? Right, the text tells us that they found that berets were comfortable and that they specifically wore black berets because the black berets didn't show any grease stains that they might have gotten while they were doing their work. Well, that explains how the people of the British culture started wearing berets, but what about Americans? Yes, during a war called World War II, some British soldiers gave berets as special gifts to the American soldiers. And then we read that American women decided to wear berets in the 1930s, and now lots of people in America wear berets. How cool. Okay, let's not forget to look at the photos and the caption with them. We see the same arrows pointing to pictures as we have seen in previous photos. One arrow says past and one says present. Now let's read the caption together to find out more. British General Bernard Law Montgomery above popularized the use of berets during World War II. Even today, traditional clothes for Basque men below often include berets. Okay, so who is that in the top photo? Right, it's a British general from World War II named Bernard Law Montgomery. Now the text says <clears throat> that he popularized berets. I see a familiar word that I know in popularized. How about you? Yes, popular 
is in the word popularized. So what might this British general have done to berets? If you said he made berets popular, you are absolutely right. What is at the bottom in that picture? What is that telling us about present or modern times? Yes, the caption says that berets are still traditional clothes for many men in the Basque culture today. Now, wait a second. I want you to look back at that word traditional. Do you notice anything about it? Right there in the caption, traditional. Think back to our word work at the beginning of this video. Did you notice that this word includes the suffix T-I-O-N, the shun suffix? It actually also includes another suffix, A-L. But if we remove the A-L, we have what word? Yes, tradition. And since the T-I-O-N suffix means an act or process of, it makes sense that a tradition is a noun, which means an act of doing something over and over again, usually from one generation to another. And remember, traditions are a big part of culture. Pretty cool. Well, great work reading closely to finish this text with me today. Now you're ready for a writing task, which means you get to make your case and prove it. Let's read the prompt together. Which article of clothing would you most like to wear? A poncho, moccasins, or a beret? Ha! Ah, what type or mode of writing is this? Yes, this is opinion writing. Very, very good. The prompt is asking us to tell what we would prefer or most like. And we learned a lot of facts about ponchos in activity one, also about moccasins and berets today. So which would you rather wear if you could wear one? Hmm. Your job will be to first tell your opinion, then use text evidence to back it up or prove it, and use facts the author provided from the article, right, from the text, about the piece of clothing that you would prefer to wear to help show why you would most want to wear that. Now, don't forget to explain how that text evidence supports your opinion. And this is where you work really hard to explain your thinking based on your text evidence. And then we wrap up our opinion writing by restating our opinion one more time. Now remember, this might go along with the Oreo opinion writing organizer that you have used in the past. The O stands for your opinion, right? That's when we tell our opinion right at the beginning. The R and the E stands for reasons and evidence. This is where you'll put the evidence from the text that supports your opinion, but you'll also not just give text evidence, you'll explain, you'll provide some explanation for why you chose that evidence and how it best supports your opinion. And then the last O in Oreo stands for, that's right, opinion again, because when we wrap up our text, we wrap up our paragraph, we restate our opinion again in a slightly different way. That's how we nicely wrap it all up. Okay, I am so proud of you and all of your hard work today. Let's look back and recap all the hard work we did. We learned about derivational suffixes about the T-I-O-N, S-I-O-N, and T-U-R-E, derivational suffixes. We read the remainder of this text, which supported the idea that all cultures have unique characteristics like clothing. And specifically, this part of the text focused on moccasins and berets, and the cultures that they were first a part of, and also how they became popular in other cultures too. And we also have an opinion writing prompt to work on answering now.
Wow, this was a really interesting text and I'm really, really glad that I got to read it with you. I am so proud of you for deciding to work so hard so that your reading brain stays strong over the summer and that's gonna be really helpful for you when school begins again. Once again, my name is Mrs. Buchanan and I am saying goodbye for now, but don't forget to keep reading, keep smiling, and keep learning. Bye-bye.